All right, so we begin our class, Second Corinthians for Beginners. Uh, this is lesson number two in this uh, series, the experience of apostleship. And uh, you can open your Bibles at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and we'll cover verses 1 to 11. Well, in the uh, introduction lesson last week, uh, we talked about 1 Corinthians and I gave you some basic information about Corinth uh, and its people as well as the church and the uh, background of these uh, two letters. A couple of key points, if you didn't have that class, or if you haven't seen that class, just to catch you up with all of us. Corinth, the city itself, a cosmopolitan and wicked city, filled with sexual immorality as well as pagan worship. Said that Paul established the church there and it comprised of both Jews with their religious background as well as Greeks with their philosophical and pagan religious background. So these two groups brought together in this one congregation. The first letter was sent as a response to the problems that this church was having several years after its formation. The problems were ones of conduct and attitude, personal conflict between one group and another group, you know, people were rising up, leaders, if you wish, in the church, rising up, trying to gather uh, disciples after themselves, after their own uh, teaching. So that church was experiencing that type of uh, divisiveness. And this letter was sent, 1 Corinthians, um, seems to have answered many of their questions on the topics that they, um, that they brought up uh, for Paul or with Paul. And it also seemed to have settled a lot of the disputes that they were experiencing. After a while, Jewish Christians from Corinth began to attack Paul and his motives, his credentials and his work in a bid to establish themselves as the new leaders of that congregation. And they begin by teaching that you needed to be circumcised in order to become a Christian and threatened to divide the church over this issue. This was not a new issue. For those of you who studied the book of Acts with me, you know that early on in the church this was a problem. Jews, many of which were Pharisees, who were converted to Christianity, tried to bring into the church the idea that in order to become a Christian, you had to become a Jew first. Uh, in order to become a Christian, you had to first be circumcised, uh, you know, uh, adhere to the, uh, to the precepts and principles and customs of the law, and only then could you become a Christian. Their idea, of course, was that Judaism came first. Christianity was an offshoot, if you wish, of Judaism, so it, all, it made perfect sense to them that first you became a Jew, then you became a Christian and in Acts 15 the, the apostles and the elders gathered in Jerusalem uh, to discuss this matter and uh, they recognized the danger of this uh, teaching. They wrote a letter to the church in Antioch uh, confirming that uh, circumcision was not necessary, that uh, the church was open to of course uh, all people, Jews and Gentiles, and the entry into the church was the same for both, that they confess Christ, they repent of their sins, they were baptized, they remained faithful. Uh, and I remember in, in teaching that book and uh, at that time saying the problem was settled in Antioch for a time, but it continued to rise up uh, throughout the years uh, after this uh, period. And we see it right here in 1 um, in Corinthians. And so the, the next letter to the Corinthians um, will deal with these troublemakers, these uh, Jewish Christian teachers who are uh, promoting this, um, this uh, type of teaching and their own leadership. And so uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians is going to deal with these troublemakers and the, change, and the charges that, uh, that they're bringing against him. Um, 2 Corinthians very much is a, a personal letter a subjective letter and it deals with what an apostle should be and what an apostle should do rather than what the church should be and do 
which is what 1 Corinthians is about. So 1 Corinthians is about the Corinthians, it's about the, the church itself and the, the members of the church, how they should conduct themselves and, and what they should believe, their personal conduct, not only that, but their conduct during public worship, a lot of discussion, the role of men and women in the church, and so on and so forth. 2 Corinthians deals with what is it like being an apostle? And, and, and it's, it's, it, it focuses on that because the problem is leadership. People are coming into the church trying to establish their leadership. They're trying to displace Paul in his position as leader. And so he's going to, you know, basically in 2 Corinthians, he's saying, oh, you people want to be leaders? Well, let me tell you what being a leader is all about. Let me tell you what it means and, 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 and what leadership demands of an individual who uh, aspires to the position of leadership, especially the position of apostleship. Uh, in the church. So uh, today we're going to look at the uh, introduction and what Paul says about the experience of being a leader in the church, as I said, in this case, uh, the leader as an apostle. So Paul's opening statement um, gives insight to the problems that he is facing with this uh, congregation, namely the personal attack and division over his authority as an apostle, which must have been very galling. After everything that he had been through to establish this particular church and to maintain this particular church, to turn around and have to actually defend himself to this particular church about his leadership must have been especially difficult to, for him. So let's begin the text. He begins by saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. No wasted words in 2 Corinthians, not a long epistle, but no wasted uh, words. Uh, you need to understand that letters in those days were written in, um, in a reverse style of than today. In other words, the signature where we say, you know, dear Joe, blah, 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 yours truly, Mike, well, the yours truly was at the beginning. And the salutation, you know, dear Joe, that was at the end. So they did it in reverse. Here in this opening statement, Paul uses the signature to establish his credentials, who he is, not just you know, yours truly Paul, it's yours truly the apostle who is an apostle by the will of God, that Paul, you see? So he's an apostle of Christ. The term apostle in its generic form meant a messenger, but it was used in a more formal way to mean an ambassador or an official messenger, not just any messenger, but a messenger from the king, if you wish. So Paul is saying here, he's not just any messenger, he is an ambassador, a special messenger sent by Jesus Christ himself. Also, in those days, you did not refer to yourself as that. Uh, you, know, you did not refer to yourself in the church as an apostle unless you were the, one of the men specifically chosen by Jesus. So there were many messengers. You know, Barnabas, uh, we use a term, uh, he was an apostle, Barnabas. Uh, but that is in the generic or general term. He was a messenger, he was a missionary, you know, he was an, a messenger. But when Paul uses the term apostle, he's saying, I'm not just a messenger, I'm a special messenger, I'm an uh, uh, ambassador specifically chosen uh, by Jesus Christ. Although he doesn't say it, Paul distances himself and establishes the critical difference between himself and the so-called apostles that were causing all the trouble in the church. And that is that he was appointed by Christ and they were self-appointed. All of that in the beginning, you have to read between the lines what's going on, but that's what's going on. Here I am, Paul, I'm writing to you, and I, who am I? I'm an apostle of Christ. The ones that were bothering them, the ones that were spreading this false doctrine, the ones that were challenging Paul and, and, and calling into question his authority were calling themselves apostles, even super apostles. You know, 
more qualified than, than Paul. So Paul, you know, he, <laughs> he puts a line in the sand in his opening statement. This underscores a very important principle in the church. There is no commission without commendation. No commission without, in other words, you are not an apostle, an elder, a deacon. You can't have any of those positions unless you are commended. You are sent by someone in authority in the church. No position without permission. That's just another way of saying it. You, you can't appoint yourself an elder. You, you can't say one day, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty good carpenter. I think I'm going to start calling myself a deacon and I'm going to start repairing stuff in the church, which is all very good. But you can't call yourself a deacon. You can't appoint yourself to the position. No position without permission. No office without ordination. Ordination, just another way of saying commendation or permission. An ordained minister is not a minister who went to school and got a degree. That's, getting the degree is not, what, you know, is not your ordination. The ordination or the commendation or the, the sending into service is done by those, the leaders in the church. And if there are no elders, then by the church itself. So no commission without commendation, no position without permission, no office without ordination. We need to remember that. It's a very important, uh, very important concept for the organization and the functioning of the church, especially in, in, in places where the church is not very strong, where you have a lot of mission churches or small churches that may not have elders or may have only one, or, uh, well, not just one, but may have only two elders, okay? Now in the Old Testament, everyone was required to worship, of course, I mean the Jews, right? Everyone was required to worship. Everyone was required to serve and obey God. However, those who did specific tasks, like the priests and the Levites, they were appointed to these tasks by God at first, and then through genealogical succession. You know, Levi didn't say to his, himself, you know, I believe, I like, you know, I like the experience of worship and I love all of that. I think I'm going to be a priest. As a matter of fact, since I've, I'm the first one to have that idea, I think I'll be the high priest. Well, we know that that's not the case. The Lord assigned these tasks. He chose the ones who would do it, which tribes, which persons. He's the one that laid out the qualifications. He's the one that assigned the people. He's the one that even you know, gave Moses the responsibility of ordaining, if you wish, Levi and his sons. Now in the New Testament, we see Jesus selecting and anointing with the Holy Spirit the apostles, and then they appointed deacons and, and elders, and then the elders appointed evangelists who then raised up elders who would then repeat the cycle. It's a beautiful cycle in the church. Elders in the church you know, commend those who will be evangelists and send them to the work. Evangelists plant churches and they they, uh, they train uh, the, the entire church for service, but specifically they raise up men. Titus, right, Paul tells them. Point elders in every city, that term in, in the book of Acts, in, in, in Titus, the, uh, a point meaning to raise up, to select and train and, 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 and you know, uh, give experience to these men so they will raise up and serve as elders, so the evangelist, when there are no elders, that's his responsibility to find those men who are qualified, who have the desire to do this work, to raise them up, set them as elders. And the beautiful thing is those men who are elders help the church to grow, they shepherd the church, the church grows. Oh, they see a young man there that has some potential, has a calling in the Lord, encourages and trains that young man to go into ministry. 
and he becomes an evangelist. What does he do? Or a missionary. He goes out and plants a church. And what does he do when he plants a church? Well, he helps to establish elders. And the, and the cycle goes round and round. That's the New Testament way of establishing, organizing, raising up a leadership, and continuing that leadership from generation to generation. Again, there are no self-appointed preachers, no self-appointed teachers, deacons, elders, missionaries, none of them. When I became a preacher in 1979, decided to, you know, I was going to go into the work full time, supported by the church. We had no elders in Lachine, it was a small mission church. But the, the church together decided that I did have the skills to do this type of work and they wanted to uh, encourage me. And so the church, through prayer and through the laying on of the hands, commended me into the work of of ministry, of preaching. That was my commendation, they did it. And the elders that oversaw that mission work, who were in Texas at the time, the elders who supported the, the, the preacher, whoever that person would be, uh, they agreed with what the church was doing. So I didn't appoint myself as a preacher. The church, with the blessing of the elders who, was, who were overseeing that particular mission work, sent me into the work. And it's the same for everyone else. When we hire a preacher, it's not just the hiring the sign of a contract that, um, you know, that, that sends them into the work. When they begin, they go up front, right? If you remember. And the elders are there. And they commend that, that man into the service of ministry for this particular uh, church. So in every case, uh, these people are chosen and trained in the same way and they are appointed or commended or ordained, all the same word, to their work by the leaders in the church. Now the point in this uh, first verse is that Christ Himself has appointed Paul to His apostleship. But no one had appointed these other leaders. They had just appointed themselves. You know the ones making trouble in, in Corinth? So Paul is saying, I, I've been ordained by Christ Himself. Who ordained you? Continue reading verse 1b, and he mentions, and Timothy, our brother. In his signature, he includes Timothy, who was originally sent ahead of the first letter to prepare them for the arrival of his teaching. We find that out in 1 Corinthians 4.17. And then he continues, first verse still, to the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. It's amazing that with all that they have done and continue to do, Paul refers to them as God's church. I mean, if you've read through 1 Corinthians, you know that they are weak, they're sinful, they're immature, they're ungrateful, and yet, Paul still refers to them as the people of God. This should be a reminder to us when we're ready you know, to quit the church because there's one or two people who don't measure up to our standard of holiness. Well, that person over there, that man over there, I, you know, the way he lives, or I don't know, whatever, whatever his bad habit is or unvirtuous action, people, you know, decide, well, this church is you know, full of hypocrites. So they, they quit the church or they don't receive the type of service or love that they feel they need. And, and it could be a legitimate need, but they're not receiving what they need. Quit the church. Find some other church, maybe. And yet this church here, I don't know if any one of us would ever want to place membership in, in 1 Corinthians, or not in 1 Corinthians, but in the Corinthian church with all the problems that they were having. I don't know if I want to place my membership there. And yet Paul still, still refers to them as the church of God. He also includes others, you know, other churches in Achaia, in the greeting since he presumes that his letter will ultimately have a wider circulation than just in the Corinthian church. And that's the way things were done at that early stage of the church's life in the first century, letters you know, were circulated from one place to another. Verse two, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord 
Jesus Christ. So he begins with a blessing upon them for God's favor and peace. Um, it's a sign of his kindness, but also of his position, because uh, the greater always blesses the lesser. He gives the blessing because he is their teacher. He fathered them into Christ through his teaching and through his ministry. And so he offers them uh, you know, a genuine blessing. Now, if you would or could summarize the experience of being a parent or being you know, um, uh, an engineer or being a teacher in a single word, what would it be? I mean, the first word that comes to mind. Let's say you're a police officer. Perhaps the first word, I don't know, caution. Caution. First word that comes to mind if you're a police officer. Why? Because every time you get a call, you don't know what you're, what you're getting into. A car with a broken tail light could turn into a gun battle and has many times. I would think you know, caution. I remember once the alarm went off here at the, at the building as I was coming in and a police officer was uh, parked you know, in the parking lot and I drove in, I, uh, you know, maybe the wind rattled the window and it set off the alarm, he was there. And uh, I parked the car in my normal space and he was just a couple of car, cars over. You know. So I saw him there, I get out of my car and I just start walking towards him. And he rolled down his window and said, stop, just stop right there, you know, and I stopped. And he asked me, who are you? And da 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 da. And for me, I figure, well, what's the problem here? I'm, I'm the minister, he, has, he didn't have to be afraid of me. But then I realized, of course, he doesn't know who I am. He's not going to allow me to go to his car and stick my head in his car and talk to him that close. So caution, if you're a teacher, I don't know, first word, dedication, you have to be dedicated. I mean, it's such hard work, it's so demanding. And the rewards, the financial rewards are just not there. Um, salesperson, if you're a salesperson or a sales representative, one word, stress. Especially if you're a salesperson working on commission, very stressful. You have you know, quotas to make, numbers to reach. If you don't produce, you lose your job. It's stressful. One word, stress. So why am I saying all of this? Paul is saying in the passage that the ministry of apostleship in a word is suffering. You want to you you know, you compress all the experience? One word, suffering. He is saying in this passage that the ministry of apostleship is about suffering. Verse three, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Notice here there's no whining about the suffering that he has to endure. We know from other passages that Paul has been whipped and stoned several times, imprisoned, he's been mobbed. There have been several uh, plots organized to murder him. This very letter is written to people who are criticizing him and trying to destroy his work. So what he does is concentrate on the comfort that God supplies for him throughout these sufferings. He doesn't focus on the suffering, he focuses on what God is giving him, what God is providing him to enable him to make it through these sufferings. The suffering is there as a mainstay of his apostolic ministry but it is the comfort of God that Paul focuses on. The comfort he receives from God enables him to do two things. Number one, it enables him to give praise and honor to God for the comfort that he provides through the trials. 
In other words, he's saying the majority of my communication with God in prayer is thanksgiving. If I were to analyze my prayers you know, that, I, that, I, that, I, that I offer to God on a daily basis, I would say the majority of them are for thanksgiving. I give thanks for what He gives me that enables me to deal with the discomfort and the suffering that I experience as an apostle and especially the suffering that I experience because I'm an apostle. I mean, sometimes you suffer just because you're human, right? Sore back, sore knee, indigestion, you know, that's just being human. But the things that he suffered were not just because he was human. Uh, there may have been some of those. No, the things he was suffering were mainly caused by his apostleship. And so his prayers were not in the majority, dear God, fix this guy and settle that situation and don't let them get me and don't let them kill me and oh God, I'm so tired of carrying this burden and uh, no whining. The majority of his prayers were praise. How wonderful you are, God, that you are able to comfort me despite all of these things that go, that go wrong in my life and in my ministry. So he praises and honors God for the comfort that he provides him. And secondly, the fact that Paul has something to offer to others who are suffering also, and that is the comfort that God gives to him. He passes it on. This is a long way of saying he is able to empathize with other Christians who are suffering, again, not because they're just human, they're suffering because they're faithful Christians. He, a well-known, famous in those days, apostle, miracle worker, inspired writer, is able to empathize with the lowly Christian who's not a deacon or an elder or a teacher or an apostle or a missionary. He or she is a member of a church offering his or her service quietly as most Christians do. And yet he is saying, I'm able to empathize with you because in a way I'm suffering the same type of things that, that you're suffering. In verse five, he says, for just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. So he comments on the fact that his trials never outweigh his comfort in Christ. The troubles are never greater than God's ability to provide strength and help in time of need. That's, that's a very comforting idea even if you're not suffering, uh, because a lot of times the suffering is um, anticipated. We're so afraid that something's going to happen that will be uh, overwhelming. You know, we're afraid that we'll have a disease or something that we won't be able to work and support our families or take care of our children, or even worse, we're afraid that something will happen to our children or oh, we'll lose a mate and how would I, how would I survive without the, my mate? You know, we suffer anticipating bad things happening to us. Even, even when they're not happening to us, we're suffering the consequences of maybe they might be happening uh, to us. Here Paul is saying, what a great comfort to know that no matter what happens to us, God can and does provide enough and more to bear under whatever may take place in our lives. And he was, living, he was living proof of it because his own personal suffering, I mean, you, you couldn't go through and you know, investigate every case, but I think everybody who was looking at him saying, wow, I'm, I, may, I'm, I may be having it tough because I'm a Christian, but nothing like what he is going through. And even to this day, right, can any of us say we have suffered in the same way that Paul has suffered specifically for our faith? How many of us have been stoned or whipped three or four times? How many of us have been mobbed? How many murder plots you know, uh, 
against ourselves because we're Christians. So in verses six and seven, he says, but if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. So in these verses he explains how his experience as an apostle is related to the Corinthians. Remember, he's writing to the Corinthians now. You're not an apostle in a vacuum. The purpose of apostleship was to bring people to Christ and everything the apostle experienced was somehow related to this charge. In these verses, Paul says that everything in his life serves his ministry both the suffering and the comforting, both of these experiences serve his ministry. If he suffers, he does so in order to defend and proclaim the faith so people like the Corinthians can receive Christ and his salvation. And on the other hand, if he is comforted, then he has something to offer them when they are suffering. Perhaps some of them who were loyal to Paul were being attacked also and suffering some of the same things he experienced. You know, maybe these false teachers, these, these super apostles who were coming in trying to take over, maybe not only were they attacking Paul, but they were attacking people who were trying to defend Paul, but did not have his skills, let's put it that way. His hope is that they remain faithful to Christ like he is, despite the trials, and in so doing, share the sufferings and the comforts of Christ like he does, and like every other Christian also does or should do. Verses eight to 11, keep reading. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope. And he will yet deliver us, you also joining in helping us through your prayers so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. And so in this section, he gives a, a concrete example of his suffering and comfort that they all can relate to. While he was in Asia, he was threatened with death. Now we don't know from what, from disease or persecution, we, we don't know. But he says he sincerely believed that he was close to death and that there was no hope. He was, you know, he was despairing, but God saved him even when he had given up hope. And he was comforted with this knowledge that God rescued him and the brethren prayed for him. He also was comforted by the fact that God was honored by the prayers of thanks offered up by those who were grateful that he was saved, grateful that he was healed or whatever the situation was. So after this introduction of his experience as an apostle, Paul is going to go on to explain why he comes to them again in writing. So this is his introductory passage here having to do with the praising God for providing comfort in times of suffering, things that they can relate to by watching how he lives his life faithfully before God. So this first passage gives us insight into Paul as an apostle, and from this we get insight into Christian leadership. Apostles are our pattern for Christian leadership. You know, we, we say in the Bible, in the New Testament, there are patterns for things. How should we take the communion? Well, there's a pattern for that. You know, what elements to take, when to take, who takes the communion, why we should take the communion. There's a blueprint in the New Testament that teaches us all those things. Uh, how we should be baptized. I, I'm picking the two things, the two quote rituals that we do 
in Christianity. Well, how should we be baptized? Well, the Bible has a pattern for that. If you read through the New Testament, you find out why people were baptized, how they were baptized, who was baptized, when they were baptized, so on and so forth. We have a pattern for that. Well, in the New Testament, we also have a pattern for leadership. Okay. And the pattern for leadership is seen not only in Christ, of course, but seen in the apostles. Christ gives us the ideal for who we can become as people. He's also the son of God. But, but Peter the apostle and Paul the apostle, these were ordinary men. And so in their lives, we aspire to follow their pattern of leadership. Okay. So in this brief passage, there are contained two small but important lessons for church leaders. Lesson number one, leadership involves suffering. Whoever is responsible is visible and whoever is visible is vulnerable. The day you say, okay, I'll be in charge of that. You don't even have to be an elder. If you just take on a project, Mowing the lawn, let's just say. Oh, I'll be in charge of that. You know, I've got a mower, I know all about mowing. The moment that you are in charge, the moment that you provide a measure of leadership, you become visible. Oh, he's the guy in charge, or she, you know, we don't discriminate. If a woman wants to mow the lawn, that's fine. But that person, all of a sudden, is visible, and because they're visible, they're vulnerable. Why? Because everybody who drives by, especially the members, they're going to be checking out the lawn. If the, if the grass has been cut, if the hedges have been trimmed, if the clippings have been picked up, if it's a good job. Why? Because they know who is responsible. When they see the lawn, they see brother or sister or so-and-so. So those who lead in the church, elders specifically, and deacons and ministers and teachers, those who lead in the church, or anywhere for that matter, will always be attacked, will always be underappreciated, will always be disappointed. It comes with the territory. Whoever takes on leadership must be prepared to experience suffering because it's part of the job. It's in the job description. We rarely mention that. A lot of times you know, men aspire to, to leadership in the church and the, and the Bible says that's a good thing. They want to shepherd the, the, the flock, a good thing. They want to serve the Lord with their leadership skills, a wonderful thing. And then they're surprised if there's pain involved, well, we should, we should give new elders, for example, uh, you know, a job description. Well, you know, you'll have a shepherding group that you'll need to you know, take care of, and then uh, uh, two meetings a week you know, to discuss church matters, and we want you to do this. And, that, you know, and then there should be another you know, A, B, C, D, uh, your share of suffering. Your share of suffering, that's part of your job description. Well, what kind of suffering? Well, people criticizing you openly. People judging how well you raise your children. People anticipating that your children should be better than everybody else's children because, or better behaved, because after all, you're an elder. It's just part of the job. And what I'm saying is, don't be surprised. I'll never say, well, let me, let me show you how to eliminate the suffering from the role of leadership, because it can't be done. The perfect leader, the perfect one, yeah, they killed him. <laughs> so if the perfect one was murdered, you can imagine what's going to happen to the imperfect leaders that follow behind. It's, it's as if there is a pool of suffering associated with Christ and His church. And when you begin to lead, you contract to experience a share of that suffering. That's, that's the first lesson that we learn about leadership from Paul through this letter. Second lesson, 
Leadership draws a person closer to God. The beneficial part of suffering is that it shows you, um, uh, excuse me, is that it draws you closer to God or it breaks you, one of the two. Church leadership will draw you closer to God or it will break you, one of the two. Paul rejoiced, not in his suffering, he was no masochist, he rejoiced in the comfort that he experienced as he drew closer to God because of his suffering. Don't we see that in families? A child, is, a child where are you going? I'm going outside to play, come here. You didn't say hi to daddy, he's home from work. You know, yeah, hi dad, I'm outside to play. Blah, 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 blah. And, then, and then you fall out of the tree and you, know, you fracture your arm or something and you're crying and you're hurt you know, and you're hurting. Where do you want to be at that moment? Yeah, dad comes outside, he scoops you up in his arms and he holds you in his arms and he dries your tears and he says, okay, and, and you stay in his arms in the car ride to the hospital to, you know, and he holds your other, yeah. We draw closer when we suffer. It's the same thing in the church. Our suffering, not just leaders, but I'm, I'm talking about leaders here. Leadership and the experiences of leadership draw us closer to God. Not just the sufferings, but the successes. When we see someone we have worked with and prayed for and encouraged and taught, we see them developing and growing in Christ and becoming stronger and stronger and bolder. What a wonderful reward that is. That's, that's part of your mission as a leader in the church. The comfort is simply a greater assurance of His presence. Because you sense it in your prayer life, in your study life, in your ministry, in your emotional life, as well as in your suffering. The reward of leadership in the church is not the same as the reward of leadership in the world. The reward of leadership in the world is privilege or money or, or power or fame. The reward of leadership in the church is God Himself. I mean, we're all going to heaven, but like Moses, the leaders get a glimpse of it first. And that glimpse is both their comfort for the trials that come from being ahead. And it is also their motivation to keep leading. You see, leaders have seen the promised land. They've seen it in their prayers. They've experienced it in their spirit. If this is so, let us always remember, therefore, to pray for our leaders, both secular and church, for they bear a greater burden than the rest. And let us encourage and cooperate with their efforts, especially in the church, since their work is done because of the love for God that they have and the love for souls that they have and not the love of power or money. I think of our longest serving elder in this congregation, Brother Harold. I have not seen him grow rich during his you know, 30, 40 years serving as an elder of the church. And let the leaders be aware of their responsibilities and lead with diligence, knowing that along with a great reward, a stricter judgment also awaits. And let us all submit to our Lord and leader, Jesus Christ, in all that He requires of us, because He has told us His yoke is easy and His burden is light. And I think that was just another way of saying He comforts us in the Christian walk. Okay, well that's enough for 2 Corinthians. We're going to stop at this point. Good section to stop. I'll give you a reading assignment for next time because we don't always read all the passages. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 12 to uh, 2 Corinthians uh, till chapter 2 verse 11. Read that over, be ready for the thoughts and ideas we'll discuss next time. All right, thank you for your attention. We'll see you next time.